Well, hello and welcome to the first ever Watchfinder live digital event. You join me here in the Watchfinder studio where, to celebrate the launch of our brand new Italian showroom in Milan, we'll be spending the next half an hour or so talking to you about watches. We would ordinarily be hosting this in Milan, but of course coronavirus means we can't. Believe me, no one is sadder about that than I am. If you're new to us, Watchfinder is of course the number one retailer of pre-owned watches, where you can buy, sell and exchange online and at locations all around the world, including New York, Hong Kong, London and now Milan. There are quite literally thousands of watches available to browse from the modern to the classic, from every brand from Audemars Piguet to Zenith, so why not head over to the Watchfinder website after the event and see if there's anything that takes your fancy. There's a link in the description below. You might know me. I'm the talking hands of the Watchfinder YouTube channel, and I'll be hosting you through a selection of watch-related topics that we hope you'll enjoy. Here's a quick preview of what's to come. I hope you're looking forward to all of that as much as I am. You can also live chat with us throughout the event. There are experts on standby ready to answer your questions as we go. For those of you who submitted questions in advance, thank you. We'll be answering some of those at the end as well. So without any further ado, let's begin. And we start with a little insight into Italy itself and its very own watchmaking history that you might not be aware of. There aren't many places in the world better than Italy. If you like food, culture, architecture, art, history, well, to be honest, if you like anything, Italy is well worth a visit. Or 20. The Colosseum in Rome The ruins of Pompeii. The Lake of Como. And the canals of Venice. The list goes on and on and on. Even Villa Mozart where you'll find our new showroom has a story to tell. Situated in the heart of Milan, itself famous as a hub of art and design, Villa Mozart is an Art Deco masterpiece designed by architect Piero Portaluppi and restored by renowned jeweler Giampiero Bodino. Originally christened Villa Zanaletti in 1926, the building can't be missed because of its incredible vertical garden. But perhaps what you might not expect to see on the list of Italian achievements is watchmaking. Humans have been tracking the passage of time since, well, time immemorial, with the first documented use of an hourglass appearing in the 1338 painting, The Allegory of Good and Bad Government, by Italian artist Ambrogio Lorenzetti. This hints at something that's often overlooked in horology, Italy's contribution to mechanical watch and clockmaking. In fact, one of the earliest mechanical clocks ever made was designed by physician and astronomer Jacopo Dondi del Orologio in 1344. The clues in the name Orologio, meaning clock, 
which was adopted with the addition of this new horological skill. His son Giovanni did not let down this new family tradition, designing a highly complicated astronomical clock called the Astrarium in 1364. It took 16 years to make, had seven faces, one each for the Sun, Moon and the five planets of the known solar system, three types of calendar, and all 107 moving parts were powered by a single weight. The Astrarium's many admirers included one Leonardo da Vinci, another Italian inventor and a man obsessed with time. He was famously known for his polyphasic sleeping pattern, whereby he slept 20 minutes every four hours to give him more waking time to think. He actually used some of that time to document the Astrarium in great detail, from which, after it was lost in 1630, several accurate replicas were able to be constructed. But that's not the great man's only contribution to watchmaking. Hidden amongst his many, many notes have been found designs for clocks powered by pendulums and springs. They didn't see the light of day until over a century after his death. And whilst the pendulum's official invention can be accredited to Dutch genius Christian Huygens in 1656, it was the Jesuits of Rome led by Father Giovanni Battista Ricciolo, who pushed the technology to its most accurate. In this pursuit of accuracy, he and his fellow Jesuits were known to count 87,000 oscillations of a pendulum clock in a single day. Italy may not be most famous today for its watchmaking, but there's little doubt as to the impact the nation has had on the advancement of horology. Just another thing to add to the enormous list of reasons why Italy really is one of the best places on Earth. An eye-opening look into Italy's influence on the history of watchmaking, something perhaps not many people really know, but now you do. Today, however, it doesn't get much more Italian than Panerai. Flamboyant, bold and unmistakable, yes, but it's not often you hear someone describing this iconic brand as technical. Forged from basic thinking and military-grade budgets, a Panerai has always been a simple hero. 00396 Luminor 1950 GT Automatic Ceramica is here to change that. First and foremost, this 48mm ceramic beast is not just a time teller, like you'd typically expect from Panerai. With a history of doing a bare-bones job of just reporting the time clearly without breaking, where a second hand is an unexpected luxury, discovering some additional complication on a Panerai is always a bit of a surprise. For the 396 and its calibre P2005B, that means a power reserve of six days from not one, not two, but three barrels for even torque distribution throughout the wind. There's a GMT hand too that neatly slips out of the way when not in use, as well as a 24-hour indicator so you know whether it's day or night back home. Perhaps not that overwhelming in your average Jeje Le Coult, for example, but for a Panerai, it's a revelation. But that's not all when it comes to mechanical complexity. The subdial at nine o'clock, what seems like an artist's impression of a meteoric apocalypse event from a worm's eye view, that's the tourbillon indicator. Yes, tourbillon. This Panerai has one. Okay, so it does say so on the dial, which ruins the surprise a little bit, but this is no ordinary tourbillon. Rather than one-minute rotations, it spins once every 30 seconds, as demonstrated by the nine o'clock indicator, and it also spins in a completely different direction. 
However used to tourbillons you might be, you'll probably be familiar with the way they typically operate. The tourbillon cage usually spins round on the same plane as the balance wheel itself, keeping things straight and level and unassuming, but not the 396. Instead, it spins on the axis perpendicular, which, from a visual standpoint, is an entirely different experience. But it's not just for show. Where the tourbillon was originally invented for pocket watches that hang at an upright angle, that traditional arrangement is pretty much useless for a wristwatch. Not like this, however. With it set at a 45 degree angle to the rotation of the wrist, cage turning on the perpendicular, its benefits come back into play once more. And of course, it's endlessly enjoyable to watch it spin. None of this comes at the cost of Panerai practicality. The zirconium oxide case in black is incredibly scratch and fade resistant and still manages a healthy 100 meters of water resistance. Whether you'd actually brave the depths wearing this 100,000 euro watch is another matter entirely. Now, I'm sure you're all well aware that a mechanical watch is a complex little device, but just how tricky is it to keep one going? We take a look inside the Watchfinder Manufacturer Certified Service Center to find out. Mechanical watches are wondrous little things. Powered by nothing more than a spring, they somehow manage to coordinate over parts into a dance that can keep accurate time to within a few seconds a day. To realize that this technology was achievable before the likes of computers and computer-aided design is, frankly, mind-boggling. Tolerances of microns, perfectly balanced components, a network of information that can reliably run for several days, if not more, it seems to dangle over the precipice of what's physically possible. And we're not talking about a device that runs for a week and is then thrown away. A mechanical movement is built to outlive its owner several times over. It does need a little helping hand along the way, however, and that's where servicing comes in. A service centre like Watchfinders is a very unusual environment. On the one hand, it's a place of calm, focus, quiet, meditation, as professionals who've trained their lives in this incredibly niche field bring watches back into good health. On the other hand, there's factory-like repetition, and combining the two requires immense, almost zen-like concentration. A steady hand is a must, too. It starts with the dismantling. Over a hundred components, some almost too small to be seen with the naked eye, are separated into individual containers to be cleaned. It's a process that can't be rushed, as one slight move could send a spring thinner than a human hair off into the void, never to be seen again. The expert watchmakers attending to this work have years and even decades of experience, with only the most skilled capable of working on the many hundreds of parts found in the most complicated watches. Every process is ingrained into the watchmaker's memory in precise detail. They can deconstruct every movement with military efficiency. Whilst ultrasonic cleaners remove the years of hardened oil from the components, the technicians in the shop set about bringing the outer shell of the wash back to life. For some cases, that might mean a light buff. But for other, more complicated cases, like the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak, 
a very lengthy and intricate set of steps must be followed. Once the rejuvenated watch is freshly oiled and reassembled, it may seem like the job is done, but it's far from over. When the slightest adjustment can cause a watch to run too slow or too fast, it's important for the timing to be checked in a number of different positions to make sure it will provide its owner with accurate timekeeping to manufacturer specifications. The work of the technicians is also inspected to ensure the outward appearance meets the standards set by the brands themselves. The technology inside a watch may be old, but the equipment and materials used to service them have come on leaps and bounds. Improvements in oil technology especially means watches can go even longer than ever before until they need a service, with companies like Rolex quoting a whopping 10 years between intervals. So the next time your watch is running a little out of time or hits its interval, now you know. Servicing a watch is an intricate, lengthy task that demands a unique set of skills that are becoming scarce. Expertly performed by people who've dedicated a career to one of the oldest still around today. Who knew servicing a watch could be so difficult? But from the mysteries of the insides of a watch, we go to the outside of something a bit more unusual, a watch that really barely exists. Unlike Panerai's stablemates, the much-loved Radiomir and Luminor, this Mare Nostrum is practically a ghost. That's because when the archives at Panerai's home in Florence were flooded, all but one photographic plate of this watch, the Mare Nostrum, were lost. Like Marty McFly in Back to the Future, this watch almost faded out of existence altogether. So why, if the Radiomir and Luminor are so well documented, has the Mare Nostrum become such an enigma? The flood may have destroyed the archives, sure, but an actual physical watch never mind a water-resistant one, should have been fine. That's because the Mare Nostrum really never did exist. It was a prototype, a massive one at 52 millimetres, first developed... Well, that's all that's really known about it. The small amount of information there was, was lost in that flood. When Panerai reintroduced the Mare Nostrum in 1992, the design for the case back was a complete guess, as it couldn't be seen in the photographic plate. That one plate was all that remained, a part of Panerai history that could have been lost forever. Well, not quite, because in 2005, something unexpected happened. An auction in Geneva, a Christie's one, had a very unusual watch for sale, badged Panerai, but unlike anyone had ever th unlike anything anyone had ever seen before. Anxious to find out more, then CEO of Panerai Angelo Bonatti bought that watch and found out something remarkable. It was the same watch from the photographic plate. So what was this watch actually for? With no records left to consult, the answer can only be speculated upon but popular thinking is that it was a deck watch. Unlike the Radiomir and Luminor, which were intended to be worn by frontline divers, this watch was anticipated to be found on the wrists of officers instead, its Angelus-powered chronograph aiding in any number of nautical calculations. In fact, the presumed date of its inception, 1943, isn't really known for sure especially since the swooping case sides and dial design are more consistent with Panerai diving instruments of the mid-50s. The Mare Nostrum wasn't the only instrument Panerai made that wasn't intended for submersion. 
In fact, it wasn't the only instrument Panerai made that bore the name Mare Nostrum. Torpedo timing and explosive delay devices, also called Mare Nostrum, were produced for the Navy throughout the war as well, and even an anti-magnetic stopwatch with a built-in vibration-proof cradle. It seems then that the Mare Nostrum wristwatch was destined to be a portable version of these timing devices. So then, why did it never make production? Well, if it really was to be found in that post-war period, then probably because there was no longer any use for it. The order books were closed, the budgets shut down. And soon after, so would Panerai if it didn't do something fast. That's when the genius idea was had to sell its watches to the public when the Mare Nostrum first resurfaced in 1992. A close call for sure, although it does make you wonder what else was lost in that flood. This unusual watch is only a tiny part of the history that makes Panerai such a fascinating brand. Next, we dig a little deeper into the origins of this iconic watchmaker to find out exactly how it all came to be. Some of the greatest brands to have ever existed came out of necessity rather than desire. Enzo Ferrari famously made his road cars to fund his passion for racing. Marte Rimac built the Navara as a platform to demonstrate the capabilities of his battery technology. And Panerai watches look like they do because, well, because it made perfect sense. Let me explain. Panerai was not, originally at least, a watchmaker. Actually, when it started, Panerai was a watch retailer. Founder Giovanni Panerai had a shop in 1860s Florence, selling and repairing pocket watches from the likes of Vacheron Constantin and Longines, to absolute was importing into Italy. Newcomer Rolex. More on that later. Between Giovanni and Guido, however, came Leon Francesco, and it was Leon who changed the tide of his father's business in a way that would unknowingly forge its destiny. He developed a side business fabricating tools for the Swiss in exchange for parts. Parts he used to diversify the business into the obscure field of wearable diving instruments. Compasses, depth gauges, torches, you name it, emerged from the new premises in Piazza San Giovanni, pieced together from all these procured components and given a good lick of Panerai's new radium-based radiomere paint. What made this paint special was that it glowed in the dark, which meant in the gloom of the ocean's depths, the instruments could still be read. Business was booming with the Italian Navy and was about to get even better. A new contract came in, one for a wristwatch that could be worn, seen and used in the same conditions as all of Panerai's other instruments. But Panerai wasn't a watchmaker, remember, and so it needed a supplier. Guido knew exactly who to approach to fulfill that request. Fledgling brand Rolex manufacturer of the new water-resistant watch, the 1926 Oyster. Panerai's watch retailer was one of the earliest adopters of Rolex watches, and the original Oyster, the first to demonstrate usable real-world water resistance, was just the ticket. But the Oyster was very small, and so Panerai specified a larger watch to be created from a pocket watch instead. All it needed was a dial painted in radiomere and some makeshift lugs so it could be worn on the wrist, and Rolex obliged. With its strap crudely held in place with a piece of soldered wire, the resulting 1936 prototype was christened the Reference 2533, later to become known as the radiomere. Being based on a pocket watch, it was 47 millimeters across, 
huge by contemporary wristwatch standards, which made it all the more ridiculous to see in the 1930s Rolex catalog alongside the brand's typical fare. Advertised with a Rolex dial instead of a Panerai one, it was clear this watch was otherwise identical to Panerai's reference 2533 because it was also called the reference 2533. As time progressed, Panerai's watch evolved. The soldered wire was replaced with proper lugs, the dial separated into two sandwich layers to increase the brightness, Oh, and what turned out to be deadly, the luminous radiomere paint, was swapped for something less so. This marks the birth of Luminor, the switch from radium to tritium, as the source of the paint's glow. But what the Luminor is most famous for, its locking lever crown guard, finds its origins in something a little bit less technical. In the 1940s, when these modifications started to take hold, something else was happening over at Rolex. The esteemed watchmaker was following up on its impressive oyster watch with a perpetual one, a caliber that could run on and on without being wound, driven solely by the movement of the wearer's wrist. This was especially good for water-resistant watches with screw-down crowns, the wearer no longer had to unscrew the crown every single day to wind it and risk stripping the threads, a problem Panerai faced many times in the field. But between the reduced demand for military equipment and the cost of this new technology, Panerai's contract demanded a cheaper solution, a crown that was water resistant but didn't need screwing down. Enter the famous Panerai crown guard. Locked in place, it compressed the seals in the crown and kept water out of the watch. Leave it out, it allowed the watch to be immediately wound. It was so simple and robust that even the most extreme conditions rarely made it fail. It's a striking example of how a process of iteration, limitation and innovation can come together to build a watch as striking and unique as a Panerai. In both Radiomir and Luminor forms, the swooping features and idiosyncratic quirks exist through sheer circumstance, without a single consideration given to aesthetics. And yet, both have become some of the most iconic watches in all of history. And that's really how it should be. an in-depth look into how Panerai got those unmistakable shapes. But now it's time to get you involved, because we asked you to submit your questions, and we'd like to answer a few of them right here. We'll start with a question from Sean. How much is happening behind the scenes at Watchfinder to determine the value of the watches you sell? Great question, and one that's becoming increasingly more important in a time where prices seem to be changing almost daily. It starts with the prices we pay for the watches we purchase, without which we'd have nothing to sell. And that's, of course, determined by what customers are willing to accept. In many cases, for watches that are hard to get or are increasing in value, a price we offer can even be higher than RRP, and that is then reflected in the price we sell for. We do have 20 years of historical data over thousands of watches to form the basis of our prices, and it's a model that's consistently shifting and learning with the changing market. Ultimately, our purchasing team applies a layer of common sense on what's fair and feasible, a balance between keeping the business alive and offering the best value. Without customers, there would be no watch finder, and so they are our priority. Next question from Ben. What are your thoughts on big watches for small wrists? This is a question that comes up pretty frequently. Over the last few years, there's been a trend for watchmakers to make watches over 40 millimeters, a size which can be ungainly and uncomfortable for people with smaller wrists. But truth be told, the question is a bit like asking my thoughts on the color red. I like it, you may not. It's all really about preference. If you have smaller wrists and love the way a bigger watch looks and feels, good for you. 
If you don't, then you'll be pleased to see watchmakers coming back around to accommodating you after a pretty long hiatus. Whatever happens, pick what you like, not what someone else tells you to like. Andreas asks, what's one piece of advice to people looking to work in the world of watches? It would probably be the same advice I would have for anyone with a career dream. Getting a job is harder now than it has ever been, but there's a very easy way to get yourself closer to the top of the pile, and that's with enthusiasm. If you show enthusiasm by being personally invested in the topic, and you communicate that in your application and hopefully your interview, you're already a million miles ahead of most of the other applicants. Many people in the industry got there through joining at the bottom and demonstrating an unimpeachable passion. There are a lot of people out there with skills and qualifications that just have no enthusiasm for what they do, and you'll stand out for having it. John wants to know, what trends do you think will dominate in the industry in 2020? Above all else, the environment. Reducing waste, reusing materials, recycling everything else. As an industry that commands such a high price point, there's a responsibility to use that position as a force for change. This all sounds like some kind of political message, but really there's so much that can be done without really impacting on the enjoyment of the product at all, that it doesn't make sense not to. Setting an example for customers also helps to normalise the attitude and can even make a purchasing experience more satisfactory. A great question from Ben. Have you been desensitised to regular watches? I wouldn't say desensitised to the watches themselves, necessarily. A great watch and a good watch still, still sit apart from one another as they've always done, but price is another matter entirely. To think to myself that €10,000 is a respectable price for a watch without flinching at the enormity of that number does require some recalibration from time to time. A watch can be good value at that €10,000. The reality of handing over that kind of money is, I'm sure, a very different experience. Wangun wants to know, do you like cats? If so, do your best meow. I don't have a cat, I have a dog, but I'm sure cats are fine. There's one in the neighbourhood that enjoys digging up my garden, but it's an animal and I can't exactly reason with it. So, sure, cats are all right. Meow. Mark asks, is it bad to hand wind an automatic watch? That's an easy one. No, it's fine. Unlike a hand wound watch which has a physical stop to its wind when it gets full, an automatic watch uses a clutch to avoid being overwound by the mainspring. This same clutch means you won't ever damage your automatic watch by hand winding it, so wind away. Jason asks, are box and papers always a must? For a long time now, the box and warranty papers originally issued with a watch have been considered an absolute must when buying, and therefore selling, a watch. It's understandable why. Before the ease of transacting online with a reputable pre-owned retailer like Watchfinder, a box and especially papers aid in validating the authenticity of a watch. And for some collectors, a full set is a satisfying addition to the purchase. But for the many people who put the box and papers in the cupboard until it comes time to sell the watch again, it's really much of a muchness. Yes, a watch with box and papers will sell for more, but that makes the opposite true as well. A watch without is cheaper to buy in the first place. And in all but some very exceptional circumstances, like you'd find with rare vintage pieces, the residual difference of a watch with or without these extras will be much the same, leaving you no better off or worse off once all's said and done. So, if you want to save some money on your watch, that's a pretty straightforward way. Fernando and many others actually have asked, is Omega becoming number one over Rolex? From a sales perspective, no. 
Rolex is dominating in a way we've not seen before. And although Omega has made some huge steps in recent years, getting anywhere close to Rolex is still a long, long way off. It may not always be like that, and if the past has taught us anything, it's that tides can change very quickly. But for the foreseeable future, Rolex is winning by a landslide. From a product perspective, that's a little different. An Omega watch, in terms of its physical construction, is in no way inferior to a Rolex, and in some cases, it's better. What that means for us is that you can purchase a watch with the quality of a Rolex and arguably more pedigree for a significant amount less. In fact, we've seen Omega prices take a jump recently as its watches have earned more attention. We'll know when it's caught up with Rolex when its watches cost the same. For our last question, Alfred asks, what is the state of the watch industry, with the Apple Watch taking a larger share each year? This is a twofold question, really. On the one hand, there are luxury watch owners who are also intrigued by the Apple Watch for its functionality and technology. For them, one does not replace the other in the same way a two-seater sports car doesn't replace an SUV. If they can own the former, they'll probably own the latter as well. What's more of a concern are the buyers of the Apple Watch who aren't interested in luxury watches at all. It used to be that a Rolex was the Apple Watch, the most available, affordable and technically advanced timekeeper on the market, but now it's very different. For many, it's a status symbol, for others, it's a passion, and for all, it's a luxury. For this new generation, it's the luxury aspect of brands like Rolex that puts them off the idea of a mechanical watch entirely. They have dismissed it in the same way they might dismiss a sports car as being vulgar and unnecessary because they saw a loud Lamborghini being driven too quickly down the high street, and so they choose to drive electric instead. The sad part of that is that the overwhelming reputation of brands like Rolex as a status symbol, means that many people may not get to discover an interest in the quirky little machines that are mechanical watches. We're seeing more and more of a trend for analog, mechanical devices like record players and film cameras, and so you'd expect a similar focus on watches. But really, watchmaking is just not inclusive enough. Luxury watchmaking is really about the opposite, exclusivity, and I just don't think younger generations, so savvy and aware as they are, are buying into it. But I do think there's light at the end of the tunnel, however small. I'm talking about the micro brands that are making mechanical watchmaking inclusive again, that are offering watches at prices that ordinary people can enjoy without feeling unwelcome. These micro brands have started a trend that I think the big players will, at some point, have to take a note of. Or it could be the end. And that's also the end of the event. Thank you so much for joining us. We really hope you enjoyed yourselves as much as we have, and we hope to do more of these in the future, if you'd like to see them. Let us know your thoughts, and thank you once again. If you're in Italy, and especially in the Milan area, make sure to book some time at our Villa Mozart showroom, where we'd love to catch up with you and talk watches and show you some really exceptional pieces. You can find out more in the description below. We'll leave you now with a little sneak peek of the videos we have coming up for you over the next few weeks. Goodbye, and see you next time.